Thank you all for joining us for our inaugural RFK Book Club. Welcome to our board members, our leadership council members, our staff, and our friends. And our special thanks to Nisa Patel for organizing this. I'm Lynn Delaney, Executive Director and Senior Advisor for Legacy and Special Projects. And one of the great honors and joys of my work over the past 30 years at RFK has been to work with the Robert F. Kennedy Book and Journalism Awards. We have an exciting launch today with Dr. Jonathan Metzel and Ned Gordon-Reed, who are here to discuss Jonathan's book, which won our 2020 RFK Award. It's Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. I wanted to give you just a quick background on the RFK Book Award before we proceed. It was founded in 1980 with the proceeds from Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s biography, Robert Kennedy and His Times which is the definitive book about Robert Kennedy's life and which I always refer to as the Bible here in my office. He described the winning entry as the book which most faithfully and forcefully reflects Robert Kennedy's purposes, his concern for the poor and powerless, his struggle for, the struggle for honest and even-handed justice, his conviction that a decent society must assure all young people a fair chance and his faith that a free democracy can act to remedy disparities of power and opportunity. For many years, this award program was under the stewardship of Arthur, and then Robert Kennedy aide, journalist, and newspaper publisher, John Siegenthaler. In recent years, we've been guided by historian Michael Beschloss. Some years we recognize well-known authors who are writing on topics very much in the current news. Sometimes it's a first, uh, first time author or lesser known writer who might be bringing a fresh perspective to the conversation around themes of social justice. Or maybe it's a biographer or an historian who has new research to bear on an historic event or a public figure. Some of the past winners have included John Hope Franklin, David Halberstam, Al Gore, John Lewis, Taylor Branch, Michael Lewis, Samantha Power, Scott Turow, Douglas Brinkley, and our own board member, Peter Edelman. So Jonathan, you're in great company here. We have two very special guests today. First, of course, our author, Jonathan Metzel. He's an MD as well as a PhD and is the professor of sociology and psychiatry at Vanderbilt University. He's widely published on medical, psychiatric, on medical and psychiatric topics, as well as other issues we deal with as a society. Mm -hmm. We depend heavily on the volunteer participation uh, for judges, and we've been fortunate that Annette Gordon-Reed has been involved at the RFK Award over the years. We've been, <clears throat> excuse me, and we are delighted that she'll join us today for our conversation with Jonathan. She'll tell us a little bit about the judging process and her observations about Jonathan's book, and will facilitate the discussion. Annette is a professor of law at Harvard Law School, as well as a history professor at Harvard University. She's a National Book Award winner and a Pulitzer Prize winner for The Hemingses of Monticello, an American family. She has umpteen book prizes, numerous fellowships and medals, including MacArthur Fellowship. And I'd like you all to take a minute to read your program notes when this is um, over to, to look at the credentials and the bios of, for both Jonathan and Annette. Or if you're feeling at all insecure about your own personal accomplishments, maybe you, you would skip that part. But for now, I'd like to turn it over to Annette who will introduce Jonathan and kick off our discussion. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much, Lynn, and I'm very happy to be here today and very glad to talk about this extremely important book we looked at a number of books this year, and every year it's very difficult to make the choice. Uh, but this one stood out to us because it is so, so timely. Um, the issue it discusses is something that even before we starting it out, it's become even more timely as we started this national conversation about, about race and history and the nature of American society and mainly trying to think about what we're going to do to try to make the society, the kind of society that our RFK and others wanted, and John Lewis, I should mention him, the kind of community that they wanted for America. And Jonathan has contributed to that, having us think about this question, some very difficult issues. Um, the question of, of whites understanding about whiteness and what that meant in terms of hierarchy, people who have gone, what we, we think of as against their interests, 
um, in order to to maintain a central a sense of racial hierarchy. This is something, a theme that has been in American history from the very, very beginning. Jonathan, you have a very interesting take on this because you look at it from the, as a doctor, looking at this as a health issue, not just politics, but the way politi politics affect people's health. Why, why did you decide to write this book? Well, first, thank you so much. I'm, <laughs> this is like the honor of a, of a career and I'm just so honored to be part of this conversation. Um, and, um, and I would say that the book didn't start out to be a book about dying of whiteness. A initially, uh, I was doing a book about, um, I just moved from University of Michigan to, to Nashville to, to start at Vanderbilt. And that was around the time that the Affordable Care Act was, was kind of coming into being. And we were doing focus groups as part of a, of a grant project that I was on. We were doing focus groups with, with white and black men around Nashville who were really, really medically ill and who needed health care. And I thought I was writing a book about, um, you know, the success of the Affordable Care Act. Like, here's mm -hmm. a, a part of the world that really needs health care, a country that really needs a, a universal health care system. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what we found in that initial research project was, as I talk about in the book a little bit, two really different kinds of stories. Uh, mm -hmm. When we talked to black men and we said, hey, here's the Affordable Care Act, men who were really poor, men who were really sick, um, would say stuff like, this is awesome, you know, this is the help we need, and it's not just good for us, it's not just good for our group, it's good for everybody, this is something that's good for the country, but um, there was a subset of white men that we would talk to um, who who rejected health care, even if it was going to save their life, and uh, oh, you I, I, yeah, I, I start... Oh, please, I was going to say, I'm just going to, one of the most vivid parts of the book is talking yeah. about Trevor, yeah. You know, who I would rather die. I mean, the first time I saw that, I was like, whoa. I mean, I, I know those sentiments exist, obviously, but to see it in print and a book in the context of what you're writing about is very, very powerful. I'm sorry, but go ahead. You no, know, but that, that, the, the, that's exactly the emotional response I had, which is that there's, you know, you can read about, about zero sum formulations of race, you can read about racial hierarchy, but when you see it, and you see the trade offs, in other words, when I would think about white supremacy, I would think, well, you know, here's one guy who's supreme and the other guy who's not supreme. Uh, but but when but when I, I saw it in, in, in action, it was very poor white men who were sick and dying, who at that moment were invoking white supremacy in ways that would kill them. And and the the, the, the example I lead the book off with is is this uh, one guy who was in his forties. Um, literally dying of, of liver disease. In fact, he did die uh, over the course of the research. I don't talk about that book, um, but uh, but but he needed medical care. And, and and when I said, "Here's this thing called the Affordable Care Act that might actually get really? you make you see a better doctor," um, what happened is he said, "Well, there's no way I'm signing up for any program that might benefit, as he said, it Mexicans or welfare queens." And so, really, that became the jumping off point of the book was think about the power of this ideology. What's this man dying of? On one hand, he's dying of liver disease. I mean, and it's gruesome when somebody's dying of chronic untreated liver disease, but he was also dying of this ideology, this ideology that told him that he had to lay down on the train tracks um, to, to stop the progress of other people, that he was a foot soldier um, standing up for this imagined hierarchy. And so part of the issue was that was kind of the jumping off point when you see somebody literally putting their life on the line to stand up for this imagined idea of race that that became kind of you know okay what are the other examples of that but there's there's nothing more powerful than seeing that because it's not just a guy up on a you know confederate monument with a saber it's also <laughs> like very poor people who are who are literally dying in the, in the way they're doing now for you know masks and, and other things like that mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And you, you talk about Kentucky and Tennessee. What's the difference? The, well, Missouri, you, the three, Missouri, Kentucky, and Tennessee, but mainly the, the comparison between Kentucky and Tennessee, two different outcomes with all of this. And you, know, you talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Well, Kentucky and Tennessee were a pretty good comparison because they're relatively similar demographically, um, racial breakdown, socioeconomically. I realized that um, Tennessee has a much better university than anywhere but other than that um and so um but no but but they're rel relatively comparable and uh but the big difference was that kentucky had decided to um you know at, when the affordable care act was coming down the pike and they had a, a democratic governor at the time who said you're gonna 
help us pay for health insurance. You're going to help us expand Medicaid. The federal government is going to spend seven um, seventy cents on every dollar to help us insure our people. Of course, we're of course we're going to do that. That's crazy. Um, mm-hmm. And so Kentucky um, took the uh, took the you know took the promise of the ACA and expanded Medicaid um, and created competitive insurance marketplaces. And and, and Tennessee didn't and actively didn't. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so. What I did is I just compared the outcomes of those two states. And what I found was that Kentucky really saw a dramatic improvement um, in many obvious ways, right? They had longer life expectancy. People got to go to the doctor. People went for checkups, not just when they were really, really sick. Sick. Mm -hmm. And so there were fewer medical bankruptcies. People ended up paying less for their prescription medications. But also, and this is other research that's after the book, um, they also created kind of social infrastructures. When people have health insurance, they're much more likely to be neighborly. They're likely to look out for each other, all these things. So mm-hmm. it created these kind of social cohesion factors also that let people kind of solve problems together. Tennessee did not do that. And Tennessee, as I show in the book, it cost everybody. All the resources went to emergency room visits. There were many more medical bankruptcies. People ended up spending way more. And, and it was just ironic because the whole idea of why, why the Affordable Care Act was supposed to be no good, according to Trump, was because of cost. But I had this great case study where I was showing that actually people who adopted the Affordable Care Act paid a lot less uh, and, and lived longer. And mm-hmm. so in a way, that comparison for me was an important jumping off point about two states that really took a different path, and just one of the many different chances to take a different path in the road and how dramatically different the, those outcomes were um, for, for everybody. And the other point I think is important is when the pandemic hit, um, Kentucky has done some pretty important things. They already had a wide insurance net, but because they had this infrastructure of public-private partnerships, uh, for people who are following this, Kentucky during the pandemic is now trying to give health insurance to every Black resident of the state. And it can do that Um, It's in a way a kind of structural intervention that I think is very important if they can pull it off, but it did that because it already built the foundation. So in a way, having this foundation, Mm -hmm. a healthcare network, I think is going to help everybody, whereas Tennessee is is really, really in trouble because it didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But do you know why? I mean, they're right next to each other. Why why one, what, is it just a matter of politics? What, I mean, couldn't they see... Have they has do you, is there any sense that these people know about this comparison? The leadership. Well, first oh, I'm the, asking you a lot of questions. First one, what's the difference? Well, between, I mean, it, besides the outcome, how did they get to these points? The, at the most basic level, not to bring hyperpartisanship into this, but when the when these decisions were being made, um, Kentucky had a Democratic governor and Tennessee had a staunchly Republican governor, mm-hmm. and 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 if you had a Republican governor. There was an ideology that was giving an inch means giving a yard. There's no way we're going to do anything. We're not going to give into this because it would be a victory for the Democrats. Um, And we see this kind of don't give an inch um, at all in all the other issues I talk about. Um, Gun policy, there's no way we could ever have a background check policy. Education policy, never give any money for public schools. So there's this idea that if you even give in a little bit and try to help people, um, you're giving up. And so there's a lot of of orthodoxy. I mean, believe it or not, Lynn Cheney is learning that right now, that if you try to navigate some positions um, that might be for the betterment of public health, but are not for the GOP orthodoxy. So at the time when this was all happening, Kentucky had a Democratic governor, um, and then um, they tried it with a Republican governor after that, and then they went back to a Democratic governor because people actually liked having health insurance. So really the main point is that um, the main issue is who's in charge, Um, And the reason that's important is because you would think Tennessee would be a great place for expanding Medicaid because we're, we have, we have a lot of health insurance companies in Tennessee, HCA, Mm -hmm. Blue Cross, all these companies are in Tennessee. Oh yeah, they're situated there. Yeah. And so you would think we would want to be like supporting the local industry. Um, And, and when the ACA was coming out, a lot of the health insurance industry people actually said, we should do this in Tennessee. This is a great deal for us. But but this, this strict ideology to not do things. And of course, the book is about race. So it wasn't just about a GOP ideology. It was also about programs that might help black and brown communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this idea that 
if we expand Medicaid, as people told me, it's like all these black people are going to be having 12 kids and it's going to drain the system and blah, 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 blah. Um, so it was very deeply tied into a lot, a lot of racial animus. And of course, mm -hmm. the irony of that is that um, overwhelmingly it's, it's poor white people who, who, um, who use the resources of the system. And particularly if you don't, if you don't expand, expand Medicaid. So it's race and ideology. Uh -huh. So a lot of times people look at poor whites and all throughout history point to them as being especially virulent, especially racist or more likely to be racist. I mean, how do you characterize, how can I put this? I mean, is it giving leadership a pass if we talk about their decisions in terms of politics or ideology? Not to say that, that white supremacy is not an ideology, but it often seems as if, if it's the poor people who have the animus, the negative attitudes towards African Americans, but not leadership? I mean, and to me, that's the big, the big falsehood. I mean, certainly, there, there, I heard a lot of racist things. I also heard a lot of not racist things. People were mm -hmm. just trying to live their lives. Um, who had the biggest racial implications for what they were doing? Um, it certainly was the people who told who who blocked the Medicaid expansion. So I think it really was the leadership and and. Um, uh, you know, in in a way, uh, the way I started thinking about it, I'm kind of a structuralist in the way I've come to view these things. Is um, is in a way the leadership was forcing the kind of base, not that they weren't doing it also, but they were kind of asking the base to put their lives on the line, to stand up for an ideology that 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 wasn't benefiting them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, um, you know, I just kept thinking: at what point are poor white people going to say, "Yes, I'm a Republican," but I but I I demand healthcare and I demand education in, in order to support you, you, the GOP, but they, they never did that. And, and mm -hmm. that was because the race, the racial divisions were, were so profound. Well, that, it's a very tough question because it's a tough issue uh, to solve. Obviously, if we solve this, we'd be, you know, <laughs> on our way to uh, get our Nobel Prize or whatever. But um, when, we, when we say, and I have said this too, this is not in their interest. We wouldn't have this attitude, but what if, what if whatever thing they get out of feeling superior, Trevor, let's go back to Trevor. He, he's willing to die for this. If somebody's willing to die for something like that, that's not trivial. That's right. a and very, I very important thing. And so while we think of things in terms of it's, you know, and very often, you know, what's the matter with Kansas, for example, you know, that, that it's not in your economic interest to do this thing, but there are things that matter to people that are beyond money, and it may be beyond their lives in a way. And so I, it's hard for us to wrap, for me to wrap my mind around, the, you know, the notion of a hierarchy being something that I would die for, but this is not a lot of people feel this way. And is there, you know, is there any, any hope of getting out of it? I, I just think talking about it in reasonable terms, uh, rational terms and, and doing a cost benefit analysis, you know, how much money you might, um, you know, how, how this sort of the story of the South from the very beginning after the end of the Civil War, what would have happened to that region if they had said, okay, you know what? <laughs> okay, we lost. <laughs> And, you know, the former slaves are now free. We're going to build schools. We're going to build roads. And we're going to make this the best society with every talented person being able to fulfill his or her potential. What if they had said that? It would have been a much wealthier, more advanced place. But they didn't. And there are these things that are important to people that we have to try to figure. And I'm not, we have to, I don't have an answer, but that really, really drive people that, um, that rationalism or you know, doesn't really speak to. Does that make I any just, sense? It makes so much sense. I just love that question. And really that was the driving question for me in a way. I mean, there are two parts of what you just asked. One is of course the historical question. And of course I'm thinking about Du Bois's Black Reconstruction mm -hmm. and, this, and this idea that there was this moment after the Civil War um, where there was another 
another path we could have taken. Yeah. I mean, Du Bois is basically saying, we just fought this whole war. We just killed a million people under this idiotic, idiotic idea that one kind of people are better than another kind of people. And, 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 and why don't we learn the lesson of that war? And why don't we um, do what the South actually did try to do for, for a minute there, um, which was create a better society out of this, you know, promise people land and wages. Um, but that, that was a threat to capitalism. And, and so what happened was, as Du Bois writes, that what we created was this idea of a wage of whiteness, um, this idea that basically um, white people might not have much, but at least they're better than other people, created this kind of hierarchy, which of course had been, been present for, for, for a while. Mm -hmm. And and it upended it upended it, uh, it upended the ability not just to create this better society but it also it upended the the ability of groups to work together um, to to advocate for for common goals right and so mm -hmm. this idea that poor whites and newly freed slaves could have gotten together and advocated for better schools and better wages and better working conditions and land um, the minute somebody started saying well those other guys are going to take your privilege. That was such a powerful psychological driver. It was very effective. I mean, you know, capitalism found out that that was very effective. And we just keep learning that lesson over and over. And then we keep making the wrong decision, right? Because I, I think about that a lot. How much different would this be if after the Civil War, we could have gone a different path? And now how much different would it be at this moment, this same historical moment, the pandemic, um, where what's needed is a kind of unified response, not a regional wage of whiteness kind of response. And so I think that's part of it. So that the part of the question is the historical point, which is these racial fault lines stop us from making the right, what I feel like is the right decision. But the other part, of course, is people are not zombies. Uh, they're not <laughs> crazy, right? They're making yeah. decisions based on the material realities of their lives. And what I did see in my research also was that the more desperate people got, um, the more they felt passed over, afraid, um, you know, um, fewer job prospects, globalization. Now, what they couldn't see, I felt like, for me, the frustrating part, what they couldn't see was that the reason that their conditions were becoming desperate was because of decisions that were made by politicians. So they could have supported better politicians, but instead of kind of looking up to the politicians who were making their lives worse, in a way, whiteness was the thing people were holding on to um, in, in a way. It was this, it was this profound thing of, I might not have anything, but at least I'm, you know, <laughs> you know, people coming up from quote unquote below me aren't, aren't going to take the privilege that I have. And so in a way it was such, such a powerful driver. And wh when I've tried to think about that since writing the book, I wouldn't say empathically, but tried to understand I guess I just was going to ask, you know, th that empathy, you know, as a historian writing about slavery, people always ask this question is you're e empathizing with someone or trying to figure out to understand them. Sometimes people mistake that as, as an excuse, but you're not making an excuse. You're just trying to. Yeah. And so I've tried to think about other times, like in my own life, like I'll, uh, it was just, this is kind of a probably TMI, but I, I was getting on a plane, you know, we, we, this, that's a, a flying thing we used to get into before the pandemic, and um, and I used to um, do that every week. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. Me too. Um, and now I'm like, I have these freaking flyer models. And what was I thinking? But uh, but the thing is, you know, if you if you're watch, I would watch people getting on the plane, and this idea of like frequent flyer status that if you thought oh. you were going to get if you thought you were going to get an upgrade, but then you didn't get it, people would get really upset or something, and it was kind of like here's a privilege in this totally false economy that's just used to get me to spend more money by the airlines. But then if you don't get the upgrade or you don't get to cut in front of everybody in the line, it's almost like you're less special, even though the plane is going to the same place anywhere. And I, mm -hmm. I would think here's a, here's a random privilege in a fake economy um, <laughs> that, that, um, that, um, that you get ends more up, peanuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more peanuts. And the thing is it really, it really matters. And so I, I would think, that must be a tiny microcosm of what people maybe I thought felt like in terms of like, here's a privilege that's due to me that I'm not getting within this economy that at this moment really, really matters to me. That in a way, this idea that there's, there's something due to me because of who I am or something like that, um, that I'm not getting. It's just, it's a very, very powerful driver, I think, of, um, you know, that sense of loss, this thing, this thing that Trump is, of course, very good at, at tapping into. Um, and so I've tried to think about like, what are the other, 
you know, what are the other ways I could try to understand that in a way? But of course, the irony, again, is that the opposite is in fact true, that societies that are more horizontal, where more people have access to healthcare, for example, um, more people have access to education, um, those societies actually do better. I mean, if we, if we close the racial wealth gap, our GDP as a country would go up 6%. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, our, um, if we, you know, cities where more people can take transit to better jobs, those cities have bigger tax bases, which then end up having better other kinds of stuff. And so in a way, it's, it's just, it's such the wrong impulse, um, but it's hard to get people to, to give that up. And it's very easy to manipulate them in, in the other way. And of course, also, as you're saying, people also do harbor these, these feelings. So it's well, they, not like it's coming from nowhere. Yeah, yeah, no, it, there has to be, there have to be those kinds of feelings coming from the top because it would have been an easy thing for, and, and this happened, I'm going back into history, for the Republican Party after Reconstruction, I mean, or either of the parties to have co-opted black votes. I mean, if, if votes are what you want, why is it, you know, why barring some sort of notion of white supremacy or belief in that, why would you only want votes from white people? You would take the votes where you could get them. So I guess my point is that there's, and you, you make this, this is clear, it comes through in the, in the book as well, that this is something that's happening all along the, you know, the continuum of things. The leadership is poor uh, the leader, on this question. The leadership and many of them ha- harbor these same kinds of feelings. It's not just uh, poor whites and it's not just Southern whites in, in some ways um, because there've always been, you know, for, traditionally there were more blacks in the South and the, it's the sort of Jim Crow was a, a visible manifestation of of white supremacy, a legal setting of all of that, that the South gets seen as the place, well, of course, that's what they do, but these are feelings that go nationwide. And, and that's such an important point. I mean, right now, it's, it's easy, and I, I really try to not do it in the book, but I do also do do it in the book a little bit, which is, it's easy, I think, for white people to say, well, it's not me, it's those racist, Poor Trump supporters. I would never be, you know, I would never be a Karen myself because it's not me, it's those guys in a way or something like that. And so I think this idea that in a way it, be, it, it creates a kind of form of othering where people don't do what I think the moment challenge us to do right now, which is to self-reflect about your own participation in, in, in this particular system. And so in a way, um, you know, and, 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 and so I think that that's, that's really the challenge of, of this moment, that how we're all being challenged is to basically say, it's easy to just to say it's those dummy white guys or something. But, um, but I think if you, if you don't agree with the articulation of whiteness that's, um, that's being presented by Trump or by the supporters or by the GOP, you also have to articulate what a different model of whiteness. It doesn't get you off the hook of just saying, oh, well, that's not me because I'm not like that because there is a lot of structural racism um, th- throughout the country. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I think that that's, that's part of the challenge of the moment and, and part of the issue. And, you know, I, I guess I've been thinking about this a lot because we're, we're doing this reckoning now and, and white fragility, another book about whiteness has become, I think, a mantra of a lot of this. And I don't, I'm not quite sure how I feel about it because I think what, what I saw was the danger, at least in, in, my, in my research, was that the danger wasn't just about deep-seated personal aspects. It was the, the danger was this, this, um, this zero-sum thinking, really, this idea mm-hmm. that basically racial groups are in competition with each other and mm-hmm. you have to win or else you're going to lose. And, and that's no way to build a healthcare system. That's no way to build an education system. That's no way to build a country. Mm-hmm. Um, and so part of the issue for me is not just about self-reflection. Um, it's also about how can you actually actively counter zero-sum formulations of race in which there are winners and losers. Because, I mean, let's take healthcare as one example. It's exactly the same as your votes example. Um, if you're building a healthcare system, you actually want the most people possible in your healthcare network. Because mm-hmm. if everybody puts in $10 and one guy needs a kidney transplant and one guy Take, breaks his finger, you have enough money in the, in the system to pay for everybody. The fewer people you have in the system, the less money, the less successful it's going to be. And so in a way, countering this idea of winners and losers, which um, I also felt like was built based on a lot of, of shame, right? Um, a lot of people I spoke with, they didn't want their health to be dependent. Like 
what like people would say, I smoke and I'm fat and I whatever. Um, and, and what their fear was, was I don't want a black person to be making up for my poor life choices. <laughs> and so this idea that basically being in a network with other people, I thought was it. Was it. So, but I, I think, you know, for me, there, wait, there wait, wait, be, wait, 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 let's go back yeah. for a second again. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. There, there people are, so make sure people understand this. People are, are, are upset because they don't want to participate in this sort of community effort with African-American people, even if it's beneficial to everyone. I mean, think about a healthcare network, for example. Mm -hmm. Everybody, let's just say, imagine everybody puts in $10. Mm -hmm. um, the incentive for a healthcare network is, let's get as many people as possible to not smoke and to maybe go jogging once or twice a week <laughs> um, and, and something like that. And that way we'll all be healthier and we'll be less you know, we'll all be holding each other up together. A, a similar example would be a mask. You don't wear a mask for yourself. You wear a mask to, to support the community. Um, mm -hmm. But to think about the world that way is to think about the world in a, in a way that your actions are related to other people's actions. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and we're kind of looking out for each other. But what if my actions are horrible? What if I'm embarrassed because I'm unhealthy? Um, somebody else is going to have to lift me up. And, and I think that idea... What I found was that that idea was so so threatening to people. That's in part the kind of untold story of the Affordable Care Act was white people didn't want their actions mm -hmm. to be um, to be <laughs> dependent on you know black people being healthier than them <laughs> and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And so you know that and which is actually what what it was uh, financially. And so this idea of being in a network together. Um, um, was was challenged and upended by this zero sum thinking. This idea of mm -hmm. oh well, it's it's either us or them. So mm -hmm. part of the idea of why we couldn't build a national healthcare system is the same reason we can't all wear masks now, mm -hmm. is because people don't think oh my actions might be linked to someone else. There's something very threatening about that idea um, for, for a lot of people, especially in relation to race. If, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Oh, no. Yes, it does. It does. It's, it's, the United States has been called a very individualistic country. When people think about the declaration, you think about the pursuit of happiness. People have taken that to be almost an individual mandate. So there's, there might be that tendency there, but if you put the overlay of race onto it, um, the racial hierarchy that was built in slavery, a racially based system of slavery that we're still sort of still living with the legacies of all of that and Jim Crow afterwards, that added to the individualism <laughs> makes for a pretty, pretty potent, uh, potent thing. Um, that's, this is depressing. Um, so <laughs> what well, do you think? <laughs> no, but go ahead. I mean, after, well, one thing I wanted to ask you is did people, how did people respond to you? I mean, did, did you know, when, Trevor or other people, when you're people that you're talking to, do they trust you? Well, certainly this book was easier as a mm -hmm. as a white person to to write this book. So certainly when I showed up, I think probably people were it, it would have been a different book if I was somebody else or I, I was writing a different book. And I try to be open about that. Mm -hmm. um, but but I didn't. I told everybody what the book was about. I didn't mm -hmm. hide that at all. And, okay. and 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 I was I was quite amazed. Um, in, in fact, the conclusion of the book tries to highlight the many, many voices. It wasn't like every single person I met um, was saying horrible racist things. Mm -hmm. um, and probably the most racist people were the people who didn't talk to me. So they didn't, they're not in the book because they yeah. didn't want to talk to me. Um, but, but I would say that in a way that the more powerful stories for me, even though they're less kind of quote worthy or memorable, were people who were kind of in the system. They weren't they were not, I mean, who knows who is racist. I wasn't giving people a racism questionnaire <laughs> and, and, and that would be a hard thing. Um, but, but I would say that I, I met so m many more people who were just trying to figure it out. And so I'd say that the other kind of categories of people I met, some people were, they themselves, as far as they thought were not racist, but they were living in a state where the people who were elected were enacting this, this racist agenda. And so it really, the risk wasn't whether or not they individually were racist, the, the risk was, did they vote for somebody who was gonna cut healthcare, cut education, let a lot of guns all over the place because mm -hmm. of these racial tones. So in a way it was the structure itself that was the racism, uh, whether or not it was individual. So 
part of it was that. And then part of it was I met remarkable people also who in the middle of nowhere, in the most unexpected places would say, I can't believe I'm part of this system that's oppressing other people. I feel like I'm living in apartheid South Africa. I feel like, Mm -hmm. how did we get here? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to be a part of this, but I don't know what I can do. And so in the end of the book, I try to give voice to those counter voices Mm -hmm. and, and basically say that, you know, I think that, um, you know, if you just watched Fox News or you just looked at Twitter, you would think every person in the South is this way or every person who supports Trump is this way. And and what I what I tried to say is we, we don't get those counter voices when we're all socially distanced and engaging with each other across Twitter. But but it, but part of the issue is there there were those counter voices there and, mm-hmm. and 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 whether or not we choose to engage with them, it wasn't like all white people in the South were exactly the same way. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, again, a lesson from history as well. There have always been people in the North and the South who had a different view about all these kinds of things. And, and Southerners can be, white Southerners can be stereotyped um, as, as racist. And uh, those voices don't, we don't write enough about, I would say historians, we don't write enough about those people, people in places who were trying to do different things, who had different attitudes about uh, things and so we sort of think that the past was mo- one monolithic thing, and then maybe that's just who we are. But it, it's not true because there were always people uh, who were fighting against some of these ideas. And white, I remember uh, uh, once my uh, my family was riding through some in, in Texas, riding through some small town, and the car broke down. And my mother was telling me about this, and the people who came out to help them was this family, you know, who was from the backwoods and they were every kind of stereotype that you would think. And they were terrified because they didn't know on this little country road what these people were gonna do. And they took them to their house, gave them lemonade, <laughs> called a tow truck, did everything. But they, when they saw them, you know, the overalls and the beard, it was like, oh my gosh, what's, go- I mean, we, you know, what's gonna happen to us? But they, they could not have been more gracious and more helpful. Uh, to them when this happened. So we, we do have these stereotypes because there are people out there like that. But as you said, there've always been people who recognize that other human beings are human beings and see them that way. Uh, we just have to sort of tap in and make sure that those voices are given support. Um, well, so and if I go could, ahead. Go ahead. Well, if I could add to that, that I think it's also important to note why is it so hard to tell that story? And like, for example, Trump would love it if everybody was the same way, but he benefits if, if by people saying, oh, everybody is this one way um, and, they're, and they're against you. In a way, tribalization benefits um, if you convince everybody that everybody's exactly, exactly the same way. Um, and then think about Twitter. I mean, I do this example a lot of times. If I write something that's really like snarky, it'll get like a thousand retweets. But if I write something that's like, centrist or empathic or like hey let's try to figure out where the other people are coming from Mm -hmm. like that'll get no retweets and so in a way um the the avenues through which we engage also benefit from from conflict in a way it's not like uh, so you really have to break out of these structures a lot of times to even try to think about ways to tell that story because this idea of polarization it's it's very it's very lucrative in a way right now yeah yeah so i mean so so you think that we're at a moment communication the way we communicate with each other might make this harder to do oh absolutely and i mean i certainly think and especially now when we're all we're all socially distanced and so all we have the only way we engage with people who are different from us i mean if you think about even about the pandemic you know you used to or I, i mean i'm in tennessee i used to meet all different kinds of people at work and i played on this softball team and i was actually the only non gun-toting Trump supporter on, on my softball team. And I'd be like, you know, just just don't get that gun confused with the bat, you know, when you're up to bat or something <laughs> like that. Um, but, you know, it, it would lead to these interesting and kind of counterintuitive conversations that I would have. And now that that public square is in a way empty because of the coronavirus, the only way we have to engage with each other is in echo chambers where we're on social media, only talking to people we already agree with, we're isolated, mm-hmm. we're not in having those kinds of conversations. And so in a way, I think that it, I, I spend a lot of time thinking and, and not to you know, oversimplify what's happening now, but it's kind of like, how can we, how can we break out of that mold when, when all the forces in the world, especially right now, 
um, are, are encouraging to engage with each other in terms of like which, which camp or which tribe are you in? And if that you're in this tra- camp, you're against the other one and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So when you finished the book, what did you think, what did you want to have happen? How, how do you think this book will help us move to the world that you want, <laughs> that you want to see? I mean, that's a tough question to ask on all no, things, but I, but I, yeah. I love that question. No, I, I, you know, I wrote this book as a warning sign. And so in other words, I said like, look, here, here are four case studies, you know, Kansas, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, of what happens when we let this politics of racial resentment guide our policy decisions. Um, not just does it have the intended effect of um, being bad for minoritized communities, but actually it's terrible for everybody. It brings us all down as a country. It destroys our infrastructure. It destroys our health. It, just, it destroys our lifespan. And so I wrote the book as a, as a warning sign to say, um, let's not go down this path. There are many, many better models of, of countries and, and societies who've been at this moment, even with our history, and then taken a different turn. And so part of the issue was, let's not do this. But unfortunately, what's happened is these policies, the ones I wrote about and many others, became unfortunately national, national blueprints. So gun policy, for example, it, I'm from Kansas City. It destroyed Kansas City and still does. Um, you would think in a real re- rational world, we'd be like, well, God, guns everywhere has been horrible for Missouri. So let's not do that. But instead, Trump has appointed Supreme Court judges who are, are hell bent, I think, on bringing those kind of open carry laws to the, to the entire country. Um, destroying education in Kansas was horrible for everybody. It just, just destroyed decades of progress everything went up dropout rates um went up you know life expectancy went down because of the education um Mm -hmm. so you would think let's not do that let's learn the lesson of kansas but instead we have betsy devos running our education system through a policy that's pretty much similar to what what happened in kansas and i can go on down you know Mm -hmm. of course we're trying to destroy the affordable care act um which was in many ways starting to be beneficial for places and so in a way the the hard part was i was writing this as a blueprint of what not to do but at least under this administration um you know it's been a blueprint of taking these horrible policies and nationalizing them and so Mm -hmm. i guess at least it documents all the stuff that if democrats do win the election they'll have to reverse (laughs) Um, you know because because i think that's part of it but i also think that no matter who wins the election um you know, I really think that talking much more openly as we're doing now about what it means to be white, um, I think is, is an important conversation about how to combat zero sum formulations of race, about how to engage, um, just like racism is structural, how, how can anti-racism be structural as well and, and build sustainable structures. So I, I hope that in a way, this is a moment where we realize the danger of this path and then, and then turn around. Good. Well, thank you. Well, I think we're ready to get some questions now. Um, I, I think people have been told to do their um, uh, videos so we can see you, if that's okay. Hi, Carrie, you had a question? Hi, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for, um, for joining us today and for this incredible book. Um, and uh, for also for all of your work on our past book awards as well. Um, so it sounds like at the, the heart of this is kind of um, shame. And how do we grapple with people's sense of shame about who they are and how they're perceived in a a political context. Um, and then that's as part of that question, um, what would your advice be to uh, candidate Biden? Um, because it's not like we do have two candidates and one of them is about division and the other one is more along the lines of, of Bobby Kennedy which is seeking ways of bringing people
people together. But how does, uh, how would candidate Biden overcome people's sense of distrust and sense of shame and um, uh, longing for unity to be successful in the fall and then successful for the next four to eight years? Wonderful, wonderful question. Um, I'll say a couple of things. First about the shame, I mean, I do, I do struggle with this, right? Because on one hand, and there have been great books like Strangers in Their Own Land and other books that, that really take a much more, you know, psychological, empathic approach to, um, to this issue. And, and part of the issue is that American racism is centuries old. And so um, part of the issue is, I mean, again, as somebody who believes powerfully um, in the um, in the RFK model, not just in individual interventions, but in changing the institutions and structures um, through which people are fair and equitable. It actually lowers everybody's competition with each other in ways that lessen a lot of the individual uh, individual forces. And, and again, I'm, they, I escaped New York for a week. I'm in Connecticut. And I think about this a lot because at least where I am, everybody's wearing a mask, everybody's social distancing. And you can actually feel that when the system is in place where everybody's kind of playing by the rules and looking out for each other, just the anxiety, it, 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 it's like people's anxiety goes down. And so part of the issue is I, I firmly believe that building equity of reducing individual racism, in other words, if people feel like things are equitable and are being looked out for, that, that's part of it. But I certainly think shame was a huge factor, that there was a kind of reflection, a, a, a desire to not look at, at themselves in a lot of the people that I, that I spoke with. Um, particularly around health. In other words, they felt like this whole Affordable Care Act was an indictment of the fact that many of the people were not really, honestly, very, very healthy. In a mm -hmm. way. And, and there was a lot of shame about why would I need the government to come help me but it was also like, I need the government to come help me, but they just, people couldn't, couldn't admit it. So how to balance that, um, I think, I think is important. And there was a really, I think, nicely done article in the New York Times yesterday, I think, about how to talk to um, anti-maskers, as they're not being called, as they're being called. Um, and, you know, it's not true for everybody, but people said, we just wanted somebody to hear our argument. And the stuff is, doesn't make a ton of smile so much of what we do is they're whatever, whatever the narrative is. Um, they didn't want to be automatically demonized. Now, I, I don't know, but I, I'd encourage people to at least read that article because I did think it took a nice approach to something that seems pretty cut and dry, uh, but that articulating people's position lets them help you hear you a little bit. Now, in terms of Biden, um, I, I do think that in his in his best moments, he, he is a bridge a bridge builder in that way. In other words, I think that um, given um, it takes a lot of top to bottom effort to to really not fall into the trap of counter polarizing in, in a way, which is kind of what Twitter wants us to do and things like that. But to actually say, look, look at this virus, we're all safe, um, and 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 think about that. And so. I do think that there's a challenge. Um, I've been giving a lot of talks about this recent, recently, and I think the couple of pieces of advice I've been thinking of, um, number one is to highlight um, the negative effects of, of zero-sum formulations of race. In other words, when there are winners and losers in our framework, we're all losers. Um, number two, um, is to look at examples of politicians who have navigated this pretty well. I think that the Bashir gu gubernatorial campaign in Kentucky, um, a, a Democrat won the Kentucky gubernatorial uh, election, and also in Louisiana, the gubernatorial election, or a Democrat won as well. And they did so by really talking to people about their concerns and not being kind of a jargony in a particular way. So I think number two is to look at 
Kentucky and Louisiana and other examples of that kind of that kind of navigation in a way. And number three, as I was suggesting before, is not to be afraid of kind of calling this what what this is that we're in a moment where there's a tremendous call to examining race, racism. And I think that calling on the problems of whiteness and saying that uh, you know as as the historically demographically dominant majority group in this country, we have to do better and there's a better way to be white. And there are other models that are based in community and engagement and looking out for people and respect and, you know, horizontal engagement. So I don't think shying away from and somebody really, I just think that that would be a, a true show of leadership right now. Thanks, Carrie, for your question. Um, I'm going to uh, ask George to, to share his. You know, on, on, on the period of time that which you're talking about in terms of the Affordable Care Act was obviously pre-Trump. Uh, and so I try and get Trump out of the conversation if I can and ask you sort of what the governors of Tennessee would say about your book. I mean, how would they react to it? Uh, they clearly wouldn't agree with the thesis. So what would their point of view be about your book? I've had these hilarious examples, of many, many examples now at speaking about the book. I, I've gone on Fox, I, I've gone on ministry television, very right-wing uh, television stations, where somebody will be going after me in a way. I mean, I like, I like talking about these things and I like talking about them with people who may or may not agree with me, but then the minute we're off the air, um, people will say, you know, to be honest, I can't understand why we didn't expand Medicaid. <laughs> I can't believe we're going after healthcare. This makes no sense and things like that. So there, there's kind of the, the main narrative and then the anti-narrative. And I've heard it more times than I would, it just, it doesn't feel, feel random, but I've, I've had a number of examples of people who um, then say, why aren't we expanding Medicaid? And so I think part of this is about this kind of two-party system adherence to dogma and ideology that people are just afraid to speak up. And I, again, look at what's happening to Liz Cheney right now, who just made the mistake of, of, of backing Fauci. Um, the whole system's coming down on her. So part of the issue is there's just a lot of adherence to this kind of thing. Um, but but I, I would hope for people um, um, look at what just happened in Oklahoma. Oklahoma just ex expanded Medicaid, like Tide potentially is turning in, in some areas. Um, the other two things I think are important, like Kentucky, for example, is trying to give health insurance to all black residents of the state. And I think there's no better way to get white people to want health insurance than to <laughs> just give it to other people. Um, so I think there's strategies that are being deployed now that are, that are, that are pretty interesting. But, but especially for healthcare, um, I think that really the, the, the existential issue is that there's a case before the Supreme Court, actually a double case, Texas and, um, and California adjoined, that could overturn the whole law, which would just be a, a catastrophe. So we'll see what happens. But, um, but, I, but I've been, you know, I, I got to speak to the subcommittee of the House Ways and Means Committee about this a couple of weeks ago and other places. So hopefully people, people can start to hear, hear the messaging. Thank you. Thanks, George. Um, okay, Richard Sternhill is going to join us. Richard, are you on? Yes. Hi, thank you. Uh, Dr. Messel, your book was terrific. I enjoyed it uh, and learned a great deal. Uh, one of uh, uh, quotes from Edmund Burke that I always found fascinating was that there can be no order without subordination. And uh, if you look back at the history of conservatism, it uh, it seems to require that uh, in its thought. There's one uh, other quote uh, that uh, allowing the masses into government is like allowing women and children a say in the family. Um, and 
And uh, did you did you gain any sense in your research that these are the kinds of of uh, that this is the kind of thinking that can be in fact overcome? Did you gain any hope in in your research? Because I I wasn't sure at the end of the book you did bring up those countervailing uh, ideas, but I wasn't sure how much weight to put on them. Well, it's funny because I'm a psychiatrist. Hold on, Jonathan. We're not training, and uh, you might have to turn off your video. Other stuff by training, but but I I firmly don't believe that the way to address this problem is to change, try to change people's attitudes. Me? Yeah, I'm just going to restart your video, Jonathan, because you're breaking up. I'll be right back. Can people hear me? Jonathan, can you see us? I, I can. I'm back. Can you see me? We can see you and we can hear you better. Okay, is that better? Yeah, good, good, good. It's the downside of vacation wireless. <laughs> um, am I back live? Yes. Um, great. And is the is the um, is the question asker still there? Oh, and that. <laughs> Okay, I I removed Richard from the the panelists to see if your video quality would would restart. But okay, I can add is, him back can in. You, okay, that's fine. No, can you can you see me and hear me? That was my one question. Yes, I can hear you and see you. Okay, great. Okay, great. I'm um, perfect. So, should I go ahead and answer the question? Yes, please. Well, so, so uh, what I was saying before is I I I. I believe we all can change. I believe we can be challenged to, to change. And I also, again, believe that part of that is an individual responsibility, an individual reflection, but it's also a change that's, that's at least in this country, uh, responsive to, to leadership, to, to structures, to institutions. Um, people may have seen that um, a Southern grocery chain was going to have a no mask policy. Um, a couple of days ago, and then, believe it or not, President Trump, of all people, said that wearing a mask is patriotic, and they reversed their policy um, within two or three hours. Um, and I just kept thinking it would be a great research project to see, even after all of this death and all of this horrible leadership and governance, how many lives did that one tweet save? <laughs> so, um, uh, and, and in no way, it's actually showing that the power of the power of leadership, the power of structures and institutions to, to engage with this. And so I think that, th that these, these have to be both bottom up conversations, but they also have to be top down conversations um, um, because maybe you'll change a few people's minds, maybe you'll change a few people's family structures, but if you don't change the, the reward system, the political leadership um, that, that, that allows people to make change more broadly, that, um, that really, it, it just they become they become um, small samples as opposed to population level changes. Well, um, do we have other questions? If not, um, I want to thank you. Thank you so much. This has really been an honor, and uh, just you know, I'd be delighted to continue the conversation. If anybody wants to contact me or keep talking, it's it's really been. Um, fantastic. Yes, and congratulations on it. This was a this was a great book, and you've got a got a lot of policy questions there that you're going to get to see play out as uh, as the years go by. And uh, keep our fingers yeah. crossed that we can all do better. Yes. Yeah, let, let's hope so. And thank you, thank you again to everybody. But yeah, let, let's hope so. Let's hope this is our moment of reckoning, and that we that we that we real rebuild more toward you know. Um, toward RFK's version of, of, of a better country. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Annette. That was a terrific discussion. I hope you all enjoyed it. I'd also like to say a special thank you to our 
Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Leadership Council Chair Donato Tremuto and Vice Chair Gail Everts for their invaluable leadership and, and their support. It's, um, we hope we can do more, more uh, events like this with their help. Um, we hope to see you all for the next book club. As you might imagine, we have a terrific trove of books to explore. And remember that any one of you, anyone out there can nominate a book for an RFK award. So please keep that in mind while you're doing all your summer reading and something strikes you as award worthy or worthy for consideration, just give one of us a shout and we'll be happy to make sure it gets into the mix. Thank you again for taking your time this afternoon and we look forward to the next one.